<laughs> ah. good. Hello, Texas. Yeah. Hello, Austin. It's good to be back at the site of Joe Burrow's great victory in 2019. Last time I was here. Good to see y'all. Off to a great start. Yeah, am I? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we'll just do a little bit of football at the end. We're going to mostly do politics. Um, if you got any questions for the speaker, please submit them at texastribune.org slash ask. Our questioner's Ian. We'll get to him at the end. I get to do the questions for the first 45 minutes, so if that's okay. Uh, and we're doing a live podcast, so we're all going to play pretend right now. Ready? Three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. Good to be with you. Uh, my guest today is Congressman Colin Allred from Texas. Hey, Congressman. Good. Hey, man. How's it going? Uh, we are here at the we're here at the Paramount Theater. We just learned Harry Houdini played That's here right. in 1916. 1916. Houdini yeah. Miller. It's been quite a quite quite a trajectory. It's come quite down. Yeah. <laughs> the wrong trajectory. Right. Uh, it is, uh, it's 9 a.m. on a weekend in Austin, so we're moving a little slow here. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, not me, I behaved last night, but uh, so we'll start with an easy one for you. Sure. Uh, you're running against Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, yay or nay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can we say, well, he hell no? You hell no? Uh, <laughs> now, listen, I mean, we've had 12 years of Ted Cruz. Uh, we, we've Ugh, seen. Feels longer. <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 we've kind of seen this, this story play out. And, you know, listen, uh, he's been an extremist, yes. He's been all about himself, yes. Uh, he's been dangerous to our democracy, yes. But the fundamental thing is, he doesn't care about all 30 million Texans. That's how you can go to Cancun when the lights go out for all of us. Because what else would you do, <laughs> right? For any elected official, something like that happens, you know, you want to spring into action. You know, Ted wanted to see if there was a good deal at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> and it's funny and it's not funny, because Texans were dying. Yep. And in Dallas, I was working with FEMA to try and bring down you know, federal resources. And we were working with our county to find buildings that had power on. We called them warming centers. I mean, can you imagine needing a warming center in Texas, right? <laughs> and there was so much to do. I was volunteering at a local food bank, because when the power goes out, the food goes out. And you know, for you to be able to just do that, but then come back and say, what was I gonna do? I couldn't hang electrical wires. And it's like, well, listen, Senator, there's a lot that you could do, but the first thing that would be required is to care. And you know, I'm a fourth generation Texan. I'm a fourth generation Texan. My family's from Brownsville. My grandfather was a customs officer there. I grew up in Dallas, raised by a single mom. I played football at Baylor. Every time I came here to, to Austin, I let them win. Um, you know, it was a, that was my gift uh, to UT. Uh, although my mom went to UT, so I, I can say hook 'em horns. Um, and and uh, <laughs> oh, come on, Tim. And so I, I know who we are, and we're not who Ted Cruz says we are. Otherwise, my story wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. And so that's why we're going to beat him on November fifth. Um, this is uh, this is going to sound like a joke question, kind of, but it's a serious one, uh, which is you can't beat somebody without understanding like what their appeal is. Mm -hmm. And like, what is Ted Cruz's appeal? <laughs> like, like, how did, like, what do people like about him, and how can you win over at least some percentage of those people since he's won twice? Yeah, I mean, th this is a this is a tough question to ask me. It is tough, right? Um, I'm genuinely asking because it's a yeah. zero for me <laughs> on, on every category. Charisma, niceness, policy, I can't, I, I got nothing, but listen, some people like them. Yeah, well listen, I, you know, I went to Baylor, uh, you know, I grew up around a lot of folks who uh, you know, voted for George W. Bush, uh, who, you know, real conservatives uh, who I respected. And I think there was maybe a time uh, when there was a thought that maybe he was a real conservative. Yeah. Uh, that you could actually, that would actually try and conserve, yeah, <laughs> right? Sure. Uh, in the classic sense and protect uh, and also grow the economy and, and do the conservative kind of actions that you know, I think is by and large what we see, have seen in Texas for some time. Uh, he's not been that. Yeah. He's been a radical. Yeah. He's been a radical who doesn't believe in the Constitution. That's how you can be the architect in the Senate side uh, of January 6th. He's a radical who, when we have common sense legislation that conservatives are saying this is a good idea, uh, like you know, when we had the Chips and Science Act come up and John Cornyn is helping to push it through in the Senate, uh, and I'm helping to push it through in the House. 
you know, he votes against it. Yep. Uh, when we were talking about protecting and preserving our role in the world, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. We had funding coming up for Israel, Taiwan, Ukraine, and humanitarian aid uh, for what's happening in Gaza and around the world. You know, I voted for it. Uh, John Cornyn voted for it. A small handful of radicals in the Senate voted against it. Some on the far left and some on the extreme far right. And he was one of those, right? So you don't believe in standing up for, for Taiwan or Ukraine. You don't believe uh, in investing in our economy. You're not a traditional conservative. So I think the idea is that, uh, that he might have once been that, I think has been disproven. So whatever that appeal was, I think we know that's not true. I hope so. I don't know. Uh, it's certainly not, certainly not his personality um, that's doing it. Uh, speaking of real conservatives, uh, Liz Cheney uh, yesterday was over here. I don't know, did you guys see that? She made a little bit of news. Uh, and she said she was going to be supporting you in the, in the Senate race. What, what's kind of your reaction to, the, the, to that? Well, you know, Liz is a patriot. She really is. Uh, she's a friend of mine, uh, but more importantly, I respect her. Uh, and, and I respect her because what she has done is you know, proof positive that there are folks who want to put their country over their party, over their personal ambitions. You know, I was on the House floor with her on January 6th. Yeah. Um, I have my story of what happened that day. Um, you know, I, I texted my wife at one point, you know, whatever happens, I love you. She was seven months pregnant with our son Cameron uh, and at, at home with our son Jordan, who wasn't yet two. Uh, and, you know, when you're the only former NFL linebacker in the room, um, and there's a mob at the door. You're the first line of defense, <laughs> yeah. maybe. Everybody's like, what you going to do, Colin? You know? <laughs> uh, you know, and so I took off my suit jacket, which is actually a violation of our house rules, yeah. you know, and, and I thought I was going to have to hold the door the president walks through to deliver the State of the Union. And my, my colleagues were saying, you know, we're, I'm going to get behind you, Colin. And I was like, okay, I guess I could, you know. Uh, my job was to put people on the ground, but one at a time. Yeah, right. Be, right? Um, <laughs> and... And, and, but on the 6th, uh, you know, I, I saw the determination in her eyes, and she has been so consistent ever since. And I have tremendous respect for it, because to me, she is a true conservative. And that means that she believes in the Constitution, she believes in the rule of law, she believes in accountability, and she knows that Ted Cruz is a threat to all of that. And so that's why I'm honored to have her support, and I want everyone out there in Texas who feels like they are conservative, that they believe in those things that they're a moderate, that they're somebody who feels like uh, they don't see themselves reflected in this version of the Republican Party. They, they're welcome here. They're welcome in our coalition. I want, their, I want to have their support in this campaign, but also want to represent them in the Senate. Um, yesterday on stage, one of your colleagues offered a different theory for why Liz was supporting uh, you and Kamala Harris. Uh, Dan Crenshaw said that uh, Liz and Adam Kinziger are putting their feelings above basic conservative policy. He said that their feelings were hurt, uh, that Donald Trump has been mean to them, and that was, that was why. That was, that's Dan Crenshaw's theory. What, what do you think about that? I think folks should remember that when I got to Congress, Liz was the chairwoman of the House Republican Caucus. And at, even at that time, we knew Kevin McCarthy was really weak. It was thought that she was going to be speaker. Yeah, right. And for her, the path all the way to January 6th was she had voted for Donald Trump in, in both twice. elections twice. Uh, she had not broken with him significantly. Uh, and on January 6th, she could have you know, done what Kevin McCarthy did. You know, he gave one speech one day and said that the president bears responsibility for this and should be held accountable. And then a week later, you know, he's taking a picture. Right? Well, and, I'll go bring some Skittles down there. Absolving, yeah. She could have done that, and then she'd be speaker probably right now. Right? So she made this choice because she had, she's, was standing on her principles. Yep. And if, if that's something that's foreign to Dan or anyone else, then maybe they should follow her example instead of, you know, maybe they should revere her. <laughs> maybe they should look to her as an example, you know, instead of you know, trying to mock her. Uh, because, you know, this is incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um. There is, Cheney was on a ticket running for president. There was another name what? on that ticket, you might remember. You have a, you have a constituent, a couple of constituents uh, in the Bush family, uh, George and, and Laura. Um, we don't know how they voted, though I suspect how they might have voted uh, for, uh, in the past for you. And um, I'm wondering, was, have you talked to him lately? Yes. Have uh, you made a phone call? Have you, have uh, you lately, no, we, we, no. As you said, I've represented him and... Um, you know, he, he, killed, he called me after I got elected, and I, I let it go to voicemail. <laughs> 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 and, 
and he left me a really funny voicemail. He's like, Congressman. And he's like, it's George Bush, you know. <laughs> and he's like, I'm you not going to do it. Do the W. Do yeah, the Will yeah, Ferrell. Yeah. And then I met with him, and uh, we had a great meeting. And you know, he was hilarious. You know, he was. We laughed the entire time. I'm a big Rangers fan. I don't know if there's any Rangers fans here, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, I grew up going to Rangers games when they were basically letting you in for free because they were so bad. Um, and you know, he had been a part owner of the Rangers, and we were talking about that, and uh, but also talking about you know what was going on, you know, in the Republican Party, yeah, uh, and how in many ways uh, he felt like he was the keeper of, of the true flame, yeah, right? uh, of of what that was, and that it was changing so much. And his his dad had just died. Uh, and they'd had a you know, great funeral that in many ways was a repudiation of some of these things, right? About service and putting country over self and yes. a long career of being a public servant, you know, from serving in World War II to you know, Congress, the CIA, to the vice presidency, you know, all the, the long career that you know, his dad had. Uh, and you know, I, I know that uh, this is not what he wants for you know, the Republican Party or the conservative movement. And I think our coalition, as we've talked about backstage, yeah. is a is a is a str interesting one. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's one that I think is pro democracy fundamentally. Yep. I think it's pro constitution, uh, and it believes in who we are and who we can be instead of trying to radically scrap all of this that we've done for the last 250 years. Yeah. And, well, I think the coalition has some other things uh, together. Uh, w wrote about this in his memoir. There are these the four horsemen of peril mm -hmm. he wrote yeah, about. That's right. Gandhi was talking about this on Fox the other day. Yeah. I was listening closely to see if she would say one important name. <laughs> she didn't. At the Trump. end of it. Yeah. I was like, are you going to mention it? But the four horsemen were nativism, protectionism, mm -hmm. isolationism, and populism. He said that they all the, the, if, if any of them were rearing their heads, it would bring peril to the country. I, I, that op opposition to those things is another thing that the broad coalition has, That's right? right? Yeah. And I, I, I just do wonder like, if there is a way to kind of leverage that to, to speak to these voters that you're going to need, these people that have been Republicans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their whole life. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I got elected to Congress. Yeah. It was in a district that was a Republican district. Uh, we had a 22-year incumbent Republican to get there. Uh, it was, you know, in many ways, if anybody knows, you know, kind of North Dallas, it was kind of the heart of, you know, what used to be the heart of the kind of the Republican Party. Old school, big hair, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. big, big elephant brooches. Right, right. You know, yeah, right. we can all picture it. Yeah, like, yeah, I think one of the most, uh, you know, expensive zip codes in the country, you know, was in my district, uh, Highland Park. And, um, and, and you know, listen, uh, that is the coalition that, that we've always built, and the, that's the one that I've served in Congress in terms of representing them. Uh, and that's the one we have to do here in the Senate. But if you care about you know, those things that you just mentioned, and particularly if you care about you know, the U.S.'s role in the world, or if you care about you know, how we're seen, uh, or if you care about that this project of ours that we've never gotten perfectly, but that we've been trying to perfect over time, uh, then you know, to me, you know, come on in, the water's fine. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I've been the most bipartisan Texan in Congress. If you're looking for somebody who will work across the aisle, that's me. You're looking for somebody who will represent you and not embarrass you, who won't pitch you against each other. That's what I want to do for our state. And we have the exact opposite in Ted Cruz. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you have W's number, um, which I don't. I only have Jeb's. I'm, I'm working him, too. But uh, I don't know. May, may you just give him a little buzz and be like, hey, for, hey Mr. President, will you put Laura on the line? <laughs> <laughs> will you put Laura on the line? That's right. You know, maybe, maybe we can get her at nudge. Just, just nudge a little bit. Because uh -huh. I, just, I suspect that they're, that they're not going to be checking the box for Donald Trump. Um, but uh, it'd be nice for them to share that with us. Uh, what else we got here? So these same voters that we're talking about, they do still have some concerns. About, I mean, it's nice that Dick Cheney and AOC are voting for the same presidential candidate, uh, but like <laughs> some of the people in Texas still have some concerns that like the, the AOCs of the world, God love her, are going like, to be very influenced over, over policy in the next administration and, and the, kind of rationalizing their vote by, talk, by focusing on policy. So as you kind of think about that, you said you've been the most bipartisan member. Like, are, there, are there issues where you feel like there's elements of the Democratic Party that you dissent from? Yeah. Well, I'm somebody who never has approached things from a purely partisan perspective. So that's, that's part of the, the background that I come out of, because I think when you're a football player and you've been in kind of the backgrounds that I've been in, you're more focused on like results. And so you know, to me, I feel like I'm in a results oriented business, which is that my job is to deliver for folks 
who are out there working hard. And I, I imagine my mom, who was taught for 27 years in public schools here in Texas, and she sometimes had to work a second job you know, to make ends meet for us. And I think those folks are out there here in Texas every day, hoping that their elected officials are working as hard as they are. But then there are things that come up that you have to respond to. And my family's from Brownsville. Yeah. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, joins the customs department in 1939. Uh, and Doing what? He, he was a customs agent uh, yeah. at the Gateway Bridge in Brownsville, which is the bridge that you know, crosses over in, into Mexico. Uh, and he served in the Navy in the Pacific in World War II. That's where my mom and my aunt were born and raised. I spent a lot of my childhood in the valley uh, visiting my grandmother there. And so when you have a huge surge of migrants, so we had a record number in December of 23. You have to identify that as a crisis and respond to it with smart policy, with resources, uh, and you have to, to you know, have that sense of urgency. And I didn't see that for some time from my party. Mm -hmm. I felt like you know, there was maybe an, an idea that, well, if it's being said on Fox News, it can't be true. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? And while- That's a pretty decent rule of thumb, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, well, listen, uh, rule of thumbs exist for a reason. Yeah, well, while the, while gotta... I, I disagree with having an inhumane approach for sure. to the southern border. You have to have a secure one. Yeah. And there is a difference. And, and so to me, uh, you know, having stunts, like putting buoys in, in the river with razor wire around it, that's not border security. Yeah. That's just being cruel. Yeah. But what you can do is put real resources into it, have real personnel, real technology. And so uh, I didn't see that. And so I was very critical of the party. I was critical of, of the White House at the time. But then when we had an effort that did come up finally, uh, a bipartisan effort with $20 billion for border security that no state would have benefited more from than Texas uh, for 1,500 new CBP personnel, 100 new immigration judges, I think 1,400 administrative personnel to help with asylum, uh, over a billion dollars for cities like Brownsville that have been impacted by this surge of migrants, more money for technology to catch fentanyl. And I was for it and said, let's go for it, let's do it, right? Put out a statement immediately. Uh, Ted Cruz said no, and he, and he said no, and he even openly said because he was worried that the impact it would have in November. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means you think you're more important than Texas, right? right. That your election is more important than Texas. And I, and I describe it as um, going down to South Texas, going down to the valley, and treating like you're on a safari, where you, you, you put on your outdoor clothes, you know. That and, Lindsey Graham picture. Right, right. You know, you know. He's wearing his border agent uh, costume. Right, right. And, and you, <laughs> You got the tag still hanging off, yeah. you know. Drinking a Chardonnay on the boat. <laughs> yeah, you want to look tough, right? And you get your binoculars, and you point things out. Okay, you, you say, oh, there's problems. Oh, I see this, I see that. Well, then you go back to D.C. and do nothing about it. Yeah. Don't just point out problems, be a part of the solution. That's what folks in the Valley expect, yeah. right? And so, and, and here's where I, I may upset some of my you know, Democratic friends here. All right, good. Um, we have to be much more, more realistic about energy. Uh, in Texas, we're an energy state. We're the number one wind energy state in the country. We're number one solar. We're number one in oil and gas. LNG in particular is an incredibly important part, not only of our economy, but also of our foreign policy, of our national security. Yep. So when the Biden administration puts a pause on new LNG uh, facilities and, and cert certificate, certificates, that hurts our national security and the Texas economy. So I wrote an op-ed in, in the Houston Chronicle saying this was a bad idea. Because you know what we're asking the Germans to do? What we're asking the Europeans to do? We're asking them to wean themselves off Russian gas. Right. Because that's funding what they're doing in Ukraine. Yeah. Right? And you know what we're replacing it with? Texas LNG. Right? So it doesn't make any sense. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. And also, it's a, it's a better, cleaner fuel than coal or than some of the alternatives that we see popping up, particularly in Asia. And so we have to have a more realistic conversation around energy, that our energy mix is changing, but we cannot, you know, in Texas, you cannot talk about, you know, taking away hundreds of thousands of jobs in the energy, energy industry. And I will never allow that to happen. Yeah, how do you get the folks that you need um, to, to hear your message on that? I mean, I was driving between Dallas and here yesterday and, uh, you know, it, this is one of these built, built only in Texas billboards. It must have been 100 feet wide. <laughs> I was like, Biden Harris letting the terrorists come in across oh, the border. We, we all know that billboard. You know, everybody yeah, knows yeah, it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, it was new to me. Yeah. It was new to me. We don't, we, <laughs> uh, we don't have any of those in New Orleans. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, 
Okay, like that is out there in the water table. You know, like that the, the, the Democrats just don't want to do anything about the border, that they're letting everybody come across, that they want to stop drilling. Like how do you, you know, kind of outside of this room, like get that message that yeah. people need to hear it? Well, of course we just have to show up and talk about it. But also, I mean, this is the record that I've had. Yeah. And so people don't have to, you know, past performance is the best predictor right, of future uh, performance. And so, you know, this is what I've done in Congress. When we're you know, taking up uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, some of the initial proposals in that were going to be fairly punitive to Texas. And so I and some of my Texas Democratic colleagues. Like what? Well, it was like basically, you know, instead of saying, we want to incentivize you to, to capture all the methane, if you don't, there will be this, these big penalties. And that, that might sound fine. Yeah. But when you have a smaller producer, right. it, those are the ones who have a hard time keeping up with the regulations. The big guys can do it just fine. Yeah. It's the smaller ones who you then, if you're penalizing them, you might drive them out of business as opposed to incentivizing Right? right, And so that, that was the, the change in the policy that we fought for and that we got along with Joe Manchin uh, in the Senate. And th that's the kind of thing where you can still move towards having you know, much more climate friendly policies and the Inflation Reduction Act is gonna re reduce emissions by 30%, uh, by 40% by 2030. Uh, so that, that's a, it's a big climate bill, but you can do it in a way where you're incentivizing the behavior you want as opposed to you know, attacking or, or penalizing. Um, all right, I wanna talk about one more kind of I is this more the, policy than y'all thought it was? No, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do, do a little more policy, and then uh, well, then we're going to give you a little candy at the end. Don't you worry. I'm, 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 this is, you know, I, I know our job up here. You gotta, it's nice. It's sour and sweet. You've got to do the balance. You've know? you got to get both. Um, the, the but one of the hallucinations that they got on, over on Fox talking about those guys is that, um, you know, if Kamala Harris gets in there, and if the Democrats hold on to the Senate, if Colin Allred gets, gets in there and there's 50 Democratic senators, they're gonna kill the filibuster, they're gonna pass the Green New Deal, they're gonna socialize health care. they're gonna expand the Supreme Court to 19 people, I don't know. <laughs> they're gonna want that. Yeah. Um, well, is, that, is that realistic? The filibuster has to change um, because it's broken. Um, and if you don't mind, Tim, I'm gonna do a little history here. Let's do it. Okay, so the history of the filibuster, as you know, many Senate observers will know, uh, was that it was used almost exclusively uh, to block civil rights legislation, to block anti-lynching legislation. I'm a civil rights lawyer by training. This is you know, personal for me. Uh, but it was used very sparingly. And it was a talking filibuster. What did that mean? It meant that you would hold the floor and you'd speak, and so you know, they had, they'd have rounds of speakers, and no, no other legislation could move while they were filibustering. Yeah. And so that's how they would prevent a civil rights bill you know, uh, for so many decades from passing, even when there were enough technically votes to do it. Right? What it has morphed into now, though, is that it's applied to every single bill, and you have a dual track where you can filibuster a bill, but something still moves. Uh, and so this is actually ahistorical where we are now which is that every vote is a 60 vote threshold. And you're not having to stand and speak and explain why you're filibustering, right? You're just, you just say, I, fill, I object. Yep. And then, it, so what it actually, I think, has done, has contributed to hyperpartisanship and has actually made the Senate less functional uh, than going back to what the original formulation was, right? Yeah. So I want to maintain the bipartisan nature of the Senate. I don't... You know, I'm, I'm in the House right now. It is purely operated on majority rules. Uh, if you're not in the majority, you, are, you have nothing, right? And uh, with very few exceptions, like the budget that we're going to hopefully pass at some point, um, where we have to come over and, and do all the votes yeah. to get it passed, because there's only going to be about you know, 70 or 80 Republicans who will want to keep the government open. Um, but except for that, it's, it's almost entirely majority ruled. The Senate doesn't operate that way, and I don't want to see it become like the House. Yeah. But the current filibuster doesn't work. And so uh, to me, we do have to reform it. We have to fix it. We have to go back to the, the original uh, formulation for it. Um, let's, there, you, oh, and one other thing. Yeah, please. And that is also why we will codify Roe v. Wade uh, and make it the law of the land. Uh, so, because, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, Tim, but you know, what's been happening here in our state is a tragedy. My wife and I have been blessed with two healthy pregnancies in Dallas in the last five years. I've got a five and three-year-old. I know you have a first grader. You know, when you, I, I, didn't, I never met my father. My birth certificate's in my mom's name and, and nothing else. Uh, and, and so when you grow up the way I did, you go to every single ultrasound appointment. 
yeah. every genetic testing appointment, and you hold your breath, because you don't know what they're gonna say. You know, they're like, oh, you did, did the little ultrasound, they're like, oh, it's a boy, I'm like, I, I can't see anything, I don't know, what are you talking about, you know? And all you wanna hear is the doctor say, everything looks good. But if you do hear the news that some Texan's gonna hear today across our state, that there's a problem with the baby, or there's a problem with the pregnancy, the next thing you wanna hear is, and here's the plan for how we're gonna make sure you're okay. But in Texas, what women are hearing isn't that. Yep. They're hearing, and there's nothing I can do to help you. And you're either gonna to have to bear this or come back when you're sick enough, or you're gonna to have to leave our state. And this is not who we are as Texans. Uh, there's one thing I know of us as a fourth generation Texans that we believe in freedom, and this is not it. And so we have to restore Roe v. Wade to this country and to the 30 million Texans here who are living under this for people like Dr. Austin Denard, who's my friend in Dallas. She's an OBGYN. She's a wonderful person. Uh, her husband is an OBGYN. Uh, she's already a mom. And she noticed herself on the ultrasound uh, that her baby's skull wasn't forming. Ugh. And Austin, uh, who is just the, you know, the best person, had to you know, leave Texas. I think she's a sixth generation Texan. She's even longer than I am. Uh, had to leave Texas to get the care she needs and come back and, and feel you know, shame about what was going on. We have cities and counties in the state saying, we're, we're gonna see, if, we don't think you should be able to drive through the city or the county if you're gonna use it to access an abortion. How are they gonna enforce that? Are they gonna pull Texas women over, ask them what's the nature of your travel, ma'am? Yeah. Can I inquire as to your condition? Or with this bounty law that we have here, are they gonna turn us all into informants, informants on each other? Yeah. Where it's, you know, you're looking over your neighbor's fence and saying, I wonder what, what her condition is, what's going on with her? This is not who we are. And so the only way for us to fix this in Texas is to codify Roe at the federal level. Yeah, the, um, uh, the bounty law in particular for me, um, I, I, I mean, I think it's been very brilliant as a marketing strategy, the way that the Harris campaign and you have like kind of re-adopted this term freedom like around this context. But the other thing, the other way that it is anti-traditional conservative, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, when I was a college Republican, we didn't like the damn trial lawyers, <laughs> all right? You want to like, try, we, yes. Yeah, trial, like, right. yeah, we're going to sue everything. I, 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 this whole notion, uh, like the incentives are so wrong yeah. in a way that, that anybody that's looking at this clearly from, from a conservative perspective should be able to see, right? Where it's like we're doctors, there are all these horror stories coming out of Texas. We're doctors, we're, we're you know, the, the conservative people will say, well, technically they could have done that procedure, right, like under the law. But like the doctors don't know, they aren't sure and they're fucking scared that they're gonna get sued. And well, so they're, they're like, jail. You know, they'll go to jail, right? And so they're like, well, I'll pass this, you know, you go to the, you go to the hospital down the street, yeah. you know? And, um, and, and like there've been all these stories that come out that the, that the incentives are, are forcing doctors to not give that's care right. that's even legal care. That's right. Like, that's, that's scary, right. even if you are pro-life. There's two Texas women who recently filed a lawsuit uh, to clarify uh, this law, who had ectopic pregnancies. Yep. Anybody who <laughs> has been through, you know, having kids or, you know, an ectopic pregnancy is incredibly dangerous. It is not a viable pregnancy. It forms in the fallopian tube. And it, it, the only thing to do is to make sure that it doesn't become a rupture. And they were turned away by hospitals in Texas, in two different parts of Texas, two separate stories. They were turned away, or in one case, one of the women's uh, doctors came with her to the hospital and demanded that they treat her, and they were saying no. And I know who was saying no. It was some lawyer right. up in you know, headquarters saying, we don't want the liability of treating this woman. And so they were both turned away, and they both had ruptures or had to have a fallopian tube removed, uh, and now their future fertility you know, is at risk. This is outrageous. And, and the other thing I'll say is that from a conservative perspective, turning Texans into uh, you know, monitors of each other is how authoritarian states operate. Yes. Right? That's one of the things they do. Yes. Right? Is where it's like. And oh, a lot if of these aware, cases, these are wanted baby. You know oh, yeah, what I mean? Exactly. Like a lot of these cases, these are women that want to have, or, or couples that want to yes. have the children. Yeah. It's like even if you're pro life, like even if you're down the line pro life and believe that life begins at conception, the law is fucked. That's right. Like it's an authoritarian, backwards law. Yeah, well, like, so one quick example of that. Yeah. Uh, Lauren Miller, uh, she's an eighth-generation Texan. I always, I, I always laugh because I didn't know we had eight generations of Texans. Like, uh, 
I met an eight generation. It goes back to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I, I met one in the valley the other day who said her family was in Mexico and then it became Texas and so she's an eight generation Texan. Um, and and she, she was already a mom and she got pregnant with twins. To your point about being pro-life, yeah. one of the babies wasn't gonna make it and it was killing the other one and her. And at the hospital uh, where I was born in Dallas, Presbyterian Hospital, her doctor threw up his hands and said, you have to leave the state right now. And so as sick as she was, she went to Love Field and she flew out of the state and she got a procedure done uh, for 15, by 15 minutes, cost her $3,000, and it saved the other one, twin. Oh my God. And I've met that kid, and it's because she got that, uh, that procedure that she was able to have that baby. So you wanna talk about being pro-life. In Texas, that wouldn't have happened. And there are other Texas women who don't have $3,000 right. to go out of state, who that's gonna happen to. There are 26,000 Texas women who've been forced to give birth to their rapist child. This is according to the Houston Chronicle, it's not my number. So to go back to your point, this is not pro-life. Uh, this is uh, deeply, deeply anti-freedom, and it's not a, it's not a slogan. Yeah. Uh, if we want to restore freedom, we have to restore this. Yeah. Smart. Um, <laughs> speaking of authoritarian assholes, um, how do we like the Attorney General you go of the state? Is he popular in here? There's got to be one. Got to be one. Is his sister in here or something? Um, the, <laughs> somebody's got to like him in here, right? Uh, Keeps getting elected. Uh, uh, there's a story that um, I just, as an out-of-stater, I just don't, it's like, you know, it's hard to judge. It's yeah. like, uh, again, for me, the rule of thumb is if Ken Paxton is doing something that seems shady, it's probably shady. But uh, why don't we talk, there are these raids on, on uh, Democratic activists, Latino groups um, that were registering voters, and, uh, and it seems pretty disturbing. But we'll talk about that story. So there's that, and there's also uh, that he's suing and threatening to sue. Uh, two of our biggest counties, Bear County and Harris County, because they're uh, they're mailing out voter registration forms. Travis, they're saying. And Travis as well, is that? Yeah, that okay, that was yesterday, I was in the Hill Country yesterday, okay. <laughs> um, and, and so, let's get this straight, okay? The counties in Texas run the elections. So, this is the government entity responsible for the election that's saying, here's a registration form that you can fill out and you can mail back and then we and the Secretary of State's office will, will verify whether or not you're eligible to vote in Texas. And all these other steps as well, to be checked against our DPS records. Uh, and, so, and, and then you'll be able to vote. That's the voter registration process in Texas. And so our Attorney General is saying, if you mail out these forms for them to send back in for us to verify, you're gonna be getting non-citizens voting in Texas. So is he saying that the Texas, uh, you know, this, the government in Texas can't verify who's a citizen and who's not? Right. Right? But I think we all know well, what it actually is. in charge is. of the government? <laughs> yeah. Right, and exactly, right? It's like the Secretary of State's appointed by the governor. Yeah. But then also, to your point about these raids on LULAC. LULAC is one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the country. It is not new. <laughs> and, you know, when you have you know, armed uh, men show up at you know, 7 a.m. or something to an 85-year-old's house and go through her underwear, and make her stand around in her nightgown while you search her house and take her phone and her computers because she's trying to help seniors vote, we know exactly what you're doing. This is not about election integrity, this is about voter intimidation, right? And what they want to do is send a message to Texans that voting is not for you. I, I tell folks all the time that we're a non-voting state and I, as a voting rights lawyer, I, I know part of the reason why. And part of it is, this overlapping laws, but also this sense that it could be, you could get in trouble. I've tried to register voters before, before I ever ran for office, and I never, by the way, I never asked anybody who they're gonna vote for. Right. I just wanted them to vote. But I tried to register them, and I'd say, you know, okay, here's the form, and then say, no, I don't want to. I said, well, why not? I said, well, I've got parking tickets. <laughs> I said, well, you know, these systems don't interact, right? <laughs> but then you start to see these things, happening in the news. And if you're not, you know, if you're working hard and you're not Just following all this. Just as a libertarian, parking tickets are kind of authoritarian <laughs> at times. I've, I've got the cameras I don't like. It's well, a we side, got rid of the side. Yeah. Maybe, I, hopefully if we get over the authoritarian threat, we can go back to arguing That's about right. things like that. That's I don't right. know. But you know, if you're working hard and you're just seeing this stuff pop up on your news every now and then and you don't really know what to make of it, you might think that and think, listen, I, you know, I, I just, I don't want to get in any trouble. Yeah. I don't, you know, maybe, maybe voting is not for me. And that, that is exactly what they're trying to do. And so this is what we have to do now in Texas is say, they're trying to stop you. Why are they trying to stop you? Right. Because your vote is powerful. Don't let them. And that's what I think we're gonna do. Um, 
All right. Uh, we got to talk about one more tough one, and then um, and then we can maybe have a little fun. Uh, there's a school shoot, another school shooting in Georgia earlier this week. Um, J.D. Vance, I don't know if you know him, uh, he's running for VP. Uh, here's what he said about it. Um, I don't like that this is a fact of life, but if you are a psycho and you want to make headlines, you've realized that our schools are soft targets and we have to, and we've got to bolster security at our schools. So that's his solution. This is just gonna be a fact of life and the only answer is to bolster security at the schools. What do you think about that? You, you and I both have kids. We do. Little ones. We do. And I just did school pickup with my buddy's kid in your neighborhood yeah. <laughs> yesterday when I was in Dallas. And I was just thinking about it the whole time, watching all those little kids walking yeah. out of the school. After Uvalde, the morning after, uh, I dropped my kids off at their preschool in Dallas. Uh, and I watched my little one you know, waddle in. And my older one you know, was holding his teacher's hand as he walked in. And I was just thinking, if anything happens to them, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know what I'll become. Like my heart is outside of my chest right now, right? And every parent had the same look on their face that day. And I refuse, number one, to accept that this is how we have to live. But number two, we, after Uvalde, we did put hundreds of millions of dollars into school safety. We passed a bill called the Safer Communities Act. Uh, it was the first time in 30 years we've done anything to address gun violence at the federal level. Uh, I voted for it. John Cornyn was the reason it passed in the United States Senate, uh, to his credit. Oh, man. Please yeah. clap, yeah. John Cornyn. Yeah. Um, I can do that. I can do please clap jokes. To his credit. And I'm probably not doing him any favors. Yeah. He was booed, booed off the Republican stage after that. But to his credit, he did that. We closed some important loopholes in the background check system. We increased scrutiny on purchases uh, for folks under 21. We had hundreds of millions of dollars for school safety funding for states to set up their own red flag laws, which Texas has not done. Uh, and so we, we've, and we also had a bunch of money for mental health because folks say uh, often after these shootings, this is a mental health crisis and this is about school safety. Those two are both true. Yeah. They're, they're always leaving out the third component. Right which is a too easy access to too lethal of weaponry, yep. right? I'm a Texan. I know exactly who we are, okay? I went to Camp Grady Spruce at Possum Kingdom Lake, okay? If y'all want to know how country Texas, you know, I can get. Um, and when I, when I was seven years old, we had a riflery range where I was I'm learning. Sorry. Possum Lake? Possum Kingdom. Possum Kingdom. No, don't, don't sell it short. <laughs> okay. Don't sell it short. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm learning Texas culture right okay. now. All right. Okay, don't sell it short. It's, it's a, it's a kingdom, um, and uh, <laughs> I, I haven't met the king, but um, and we had a referee range where we were learning how to shoot 22s when I was seven years old. It wasn't until you I held left. On seven? Yeah, yeah. No. Yes. Really? Yes. You held a gun when you were seven? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know. It wasn't until I left I'm Texas. In, <laughs> I'm out of my element. I'm out of my element. I was this in the Denver suburbs, thing. you know? Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't until I left Texas and started hearing from folks that it's unusual in other states <laughs> yeah. to give a gun to a seven-year-old. It is, right? yeah. You know what it was about? And I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah. It was about learning how to safely and responsibly handle a firearm. Yeah. That's the whole thing. It was incredibly safe. And I, I know it's funny, but they, you know, it was all very, you know, very rote. And so like, there was no chance for any accidents. It was very safe. And it was about learning how to do this safely and to have fun. Yeah. That's the Texas culture that I believe in, one of responsible gun ownership. One where this is part of our culture. Folks have a lot of firearms here in Texas. That's good. That's fine. Uh, you know, most of the folks I grew up my, you know, anyway, most of the folks I grew up with have small arsenals, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and that's fine. But we have to be responsible with it. Yeah. And this is where, when we come to things like, you know, what happened in Georgia, where having access to an AR, uh, and this is what you see what happened with the, the father who's been charged, uh, and then, th then we see what happens. We have to uh, have laws in this country that take and keep these incredibly destructive weapons out of the hands of folks who shouldn't have it. Ted Cruz voted against that bill. Okay? Yep. So Ted Cruz voted against the Safer Communities Act. He seems to believe there's nothing that we can do uh, to help save lives consistent with the Second Amendment. Uh, I fundamentally disagree. Um. Uh, our man, 
my, you know, my man, Beto, um, got in a little trouble on this one. I, I mean, though, say what you want. Uh, but I, I do think that as you talk about this balance, right, like how you win over Texas voters, like how do you kind of think about that challenge, right? Like this, this idea yeah. that maybe, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there are people in Texas that feel like the Dem Democrats are going to, like, you know, come and start confiscating their arsenals, you know? Yeah. Listen, I, you know, I, obviously there's some folks that, if you're fetishizing you know, these things, then, you know, that, we're probably not gonna have an open conversation. Right. But I come across a lot of well-meaning Texans, and I do mean well-meaning, who'll tell me, you know, listen, this is, you know, it's important to me. This is a part of our culture, it's a part of, you know, uh, that I've taught my children you know, how to hunt. I, I think we should have the ability to have self-protection. No one's putting that in question. And when I'm in the United States Senate, I'll have nothing to worry about. What we will do is make it harder for folks that shouldn't have access to these high-powered rifles to get access to them. Yep. Uh, and that's what I think is consistent with who we are as Texans and the Second Amendment. So, uh, so just, just to be clear, so seven-year-olds, should you be able to go into a Walmart and purchase we didn't an AR-15 here? In the, uh, in, I just, I don't, it's hard for me to know the rules these days, but uh, apparently, apparently teenagers can just buy ARs now in a lot of places. That's true, actually, unfortunately, and we have to change that. Yep. Uh, the shooter in Uvalde, the murderer, um, killed, murdered 19 children and two teachers. He couldn't buy a beer. He couldn't buy a handgun. Yeah. But he could buy an AR. Couldn't buy a SIG. He couldn't buy a Zin. Right. And so th th this is obviously That's absurd. Insane. It's obviously absurd. Yeah. Right. And so we can change that. But we have to have leaders in place who want to. So. Amen. Um, let's also talk do a little politic. And so when I, I had Beto on the pod a couple weeks ago, and um, I was asking about your race yeah. and um, you know the challenges and or the opportunities. And uh, here was his feedback. He said, um, you know, I think he can win if he can raise and deploy enough money. We should see more of them, more unscripted moments, more connecting with people. Uh, what, 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 what do you think about that? Like, what's the, how do you do it? How do you break through where he wasn't able to? Yeah. Well, listen, this is a, we've got a great state. It's a massive state. In the last month, we've done 50 stops in 22 cities. And we also have to have the resources to make sure we can communicate in the biggest media markets in the country and also in markets, that, places that are completely siloed from each other. Yeah. What happens in Houston, nobody knows about in Dallas, right. <laughs> by and large. Uh, what happens in Austin is unknown in El Paso, right? Because the distances are so vast here. And so uh, it, it is a challenge in terms of, you know, making sure that you can get in front of everybody. Uh, but I, we're doing everything we possibly can uh, to make sure we do that. But also, we're making sure that folks know what Ted Cruz has not been doing. I want to make sure that folks know what I'll do and who I am, how I've served in Congress, how I'll serve in the Senate. Uh, but one thing that you know, we have done and that I think we'll continue to do is show what Ted Cruz has not been doing over his time in the Senate, that he's you know, trying to take away uh, Social Security and Medicare, that he is singularly responsible uh, for this abortion ban that we have in this state because he put the judges on the district court the circuit court and the Supreme Court, he backed the state legislators and primaries often who are more extreme to then who are the ones that pass these laws at the state level. He called for and, and cheered you know, the Dobbs decision. And actually, when he ran for president, wanted to go further, wanted to have a personhood, so-called amendment that would ban things like IVF uh, and certain forms of abortion or certain forms of um, uh, birth control. And so, you know, listen, we have to make sure the Texans know that as well. And that fundamentally, the choice here is between the most bipartisan Texan in Congress who will care about all of us, who will represent all of us, who's served in a way it shows it's possible to bring folks together instead of pitting them against each other, versus the most extreme senator in the country who's been all about himself and who has been podcasting more than you, Tim. He's podcasting a lot. More than you. I'm three. beating him in the rankings. I've been checking. I've been checking. Is that right? I, oh, yeah, he had me yeah. for a little while, but we passed him. I don't know. Maybe the campaign's three, distracted three, him a little can bit. Can you imagine, though, representing 30 million people and then doing three to five podcasts a week. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of podcasts. It's a lot of bloviating, <laughs> yes. right, you know? Um, what about the getting attention side of things? I don't know, you know, I so putting on my old former Republican strategist hat, you know, Republicans like to do those ads, like got the guns and they're shooting people and they're like, I'm gonna take, we're gonna take out the, you know, we're gonna take out the, the ballot boxes, was one I saw recently. Uh, maybe you, you should do like some tackling drills. Like I'm gonna be taking out Ken Paxton. You have like little fake Ken Paxton. I, I don't know, is there? Do you, do you need to do? Do you need to do any? Do you need to steal anything from my old people to get any attention or anything? Hmm. Okay, I'll take it on. Well, that's brainstorm. We're brainstorming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just we're just brainstorming. Yeah. Um, 
I told you backstage. No bad ideas in a brainstorm. No bad ideas. <laughs> yeah, right. 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 Just throwing stuff against the wall. Yeah. Um, I was, I was uh, last night. I was watching the uh, Eagles Packers game with uh, one of my one of my friends from college, and uh, he brought a mutual friend along. And he's one of these like Joe Rogan listening bros. And there's like a lot of conversation about this right now. There's this huge like an unprecedented gender gap. There's always been a gender gap, but unprecedented wide gender gap. Yeah. There's a group of young men out there that are not socially conservative, they yeah. don't want a Donald Trump autocracy, really, but like culturally, mm -hmm. they have felt, uh, whatever, dis 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 disaggregated from the democratic establishment, fairly or unfairly. Yeah. How, do you, how do you like get, it feels like those should be gettable folks for you, yeah. you know, NFL yeah. player, you're not yeah. scary, you're not, you know, like, what, what have you thought about that? No, I have, and you know, it's actually interesting, because you know, because I'm raising two boys, and, and I've, I've, I think a lot about, uh, you know, where masculinity is at the moment, um, but also how do we, in the, in the course of this campaign, how do we reach these increasingly disaffected young men? Uh, and you know, in, in a lot of ways, that was kind of, I wasn't disaffected, but I, I was in their shoes. You know, I was you know, just trying to make it. You know, uh, I was, when I went to law school at 28 years old, it was the first time in my adult life that I was not making my living off the sweat of my brow. Right, I knew I know what it's like to shower after work, you know, not before it. Right, like uh, I, when I you're podcasting like me and Ted Cruz, that's not really a problem. <laughs> right. you, know, you can maybe he gets sweaty podcasting. He's kind of I don't know. Right. He's not really in fit, so it might yeah. be it might be onerous for him. But it's yeah. not one of those jobs. But you know, I, I was you know, I was captain of the team at Baylor, and, and I think what comes with that is is kind of an understanding, uh, and you know, and work, working around young men who are kind of feeling like, well, listen. Are you, do you care about me, though? Right. And I think that's it's, it's fundamentally a lot of what we talk about uh, in politics uh, can feel, to, I think, to young men like it's not about them. Uh, and so it's my job to make sure that they know that I'm going to make sure that they have opportunities to take care of their families, uh, to uh, get ahead, uh, that we want to put in place these ladders of opportunity that they can then take advantage of. And it's up to them from there. And that fundamentally, I'm going to care about them. I wake up every day thinking about what's best for them as opposed to what's best for me. Yeah. And, and that's the message that we have to make sure we break through on. But I do think, you know, coming from a you know, single parent background, you know, going to our public schools, uh, you know, playing sports here, uh, and having made it you know, in that regard, this is what you know, a lot of young men that I come across, this is what they'd like to do or what they'd like the kids to be able to do. Yeah. Right? And so that, there's, there's a connection that we have to build there. Yeah. Is there a way to get to, I mean, have, uh, maybe you're already doing this, and I just haven't noticed it since I'm, you know, not a Texan. Uh, but, like, is there a way to get to these guys through, I don't know, sports talk or, like, uh, you know, other ways besides, you know, doing the traditional? Yeah, and we, we, we've been doing some of that. And, and that's, that's some of the stuff I really enjoy, actually, you know. It's, oh, yeah. It's because also it's not, it's not so political. And, yeah. Yeah, listen, obviously I'm in office and I'm running for office. I'm actually just not a hyperpartisan. Like I, I'm, I'm not. I've never come at things that way. I'm not. I don't wake up in the morning and think, "What's Team Blue doing today?" You know, I'm. I don't. You know, the, the my uh, my thought process is not about politics at all times. This morning, I was. You, you uh, didn't have like a little picture of Walter Mondale in your bedroom <laughs> right. growing up, or yeah, the uh, great de Democratic leaders, pa Ann Richards. Do you have an Ann Richards poster? Well, I, I do have an Ann Richards. That's that's yeah. Ann. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of bridge yeah. the political cultural divide a little bit, you know. Yeah, that, that, my, my mom was a huge Ann Richards fan, <laughs> and so was I. Um, and Cecile Richards uh, is a friend. Um, uh, but you know, listen, like I, you know, I woke up this morning, and, and all I wanted to, to you know figure out was what happened in the game last night, yeah. you know. Um, and and I, that, that's how a lot of people are. And so those are the those are the opportunities that I appreciate. Uh, so what's what's the problem with the Cowboys? Like, <laughs> things are things are ugly over there. It seems like they're in shambles. The Texans are going to be good. Texans yeah. are going to be yeah. good, I think. Yeah, good. But the Cowboys yeah. are in shambles. They had such a good year, and it's just all falling apart. It's just Jerry. What's what's happening? Is Jerry, Jerry blowing it? I don't. I, I don't. They they won twelve games. I yeah, mean, I know. you know, I, listen. They 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 flamed out in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and that's been a consistent problem <laughs> uh, for them not performing in the playoffs. But they've got an incredibly talented team. I think they're going to have a good year, actually. You think they're going to have a good year? Yeah, but I just don't know what they'll do. In the playoffs, yeah, uh, and so I, I think they're going to be okay. They got, you know, they got a lot of talent. But to me, the better team in Texas professionally is probably going to be the Texans. Uh, they got a, uh, and I say that uh, as somebody who the Texans were my division rival uh, when I was in the. Oh, you're, yeah, I really did not like uh, the Texans. Mm. Uh, that was back when, 
they, they were really good. And it, Matt Schaub was a quarterback, Andre Johnson at receiver, uh, Adrian, uh, Aaron Foster at running back. They had kind of a, a triple attack there. Uh, and they ran this really annoying stretch play that was very hard for defenses yeah. to stop. Anyway. You ever so, get a good hit on Arian Foster? Uh, Arian? I don't know. Probably. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was more of the guy who came in in short yardage and goal line or if somebody got hurt or special teams, which is what they do before they go to, uh, to the commercial. Got it. Yeah, right? yeah. So um, uh, that's how I made my career. Uh, and, but I think they're going to be really good. they got a great young quarterback, and they got a really talented team. Yeah, they're good. Too. And I played against their head coach, actually, uh, who's a great guy. All right. We're going to audience questions. I'm boring people with football. We've seen two, we've seen two ladies leave already. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> We can talk about uh, we can talk about whatever y'all. We can uh, backstage. We can do a little gay lady talk. You know, we can get off this football. Um, we had some questions. Ian, do you have you have questions? Are you in charge of that? There's an Ian somewhere. Hey, All right. there he is. There, you go. there he is. <laughs> Actually, before I get to Ian, can we just end the podcast here? Hey, everybody, that was Congressman Colin Allred running against Ted Cruz. Thanks so much for coming on the Bulwark Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, first question. Uh, water levels in Texas have remained critically low in places like Brownville in the face of recent droughts. What can you do to help ensure that Texas doesn't run out of water? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just in the run valley. Out of water? <laughs> yeah, they, they, we are actually. I was just in the valley, and they have been going through a drought, although it was raining, uh, which is good, uh, and I really mean that. Uh, listen, there's, there's multiple components to this. Uh, there's a foreign policy one. Uh, which is that we have to make sure Mexico kind of keeps their commitments and releases the water that the valley uh, relies on. Uh, there is an infrastructure challenge. Uh, here in Texas, we waste billions of gallons of water uh, to faulty and aging infrastructure. Uh, this is something that we try to address, and we'll, the money is starting to come in uh, with the infrastructure bill that I voted for, that Ted Cruz voted against. Right? Uh, and then there's efficiency and making sure that what we have, you know, we're using more wisely. It's not just in, in the valley, it's also uh, in the panhandle. Uh, folks relying on uh, the Ogallala aquifer there uh, that is you know, being drawn on. And you know, we're facing some very real water challenges. And we have cities like DFW and the, the DFW Metroplex that are growing so incredibly rapidly. And when it comes to things like that, you have to plan decades in advance. Uh, and so this is why it's important to have people who actually are serious about investing uh, in what's com what comes next. So when you see the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which Mitch McConnell voted for, which I voted for, I'm on the infrastructure committee in the House, and you see someone like me say, we're getting you know, $35 billion over five years, and it's going into our water infrastructure, into our roads and our bridges, our airports, our ports of entry, uh, our ports. This is the kind of things that we're talking about. And also resiliency for the extreme weather events that we know that we're going to be experiencing. right? Uh, and, and then when you see someone like Ted Cruz vote against it, understand that that's what they're voting against. They're voting against our ability uh, to prepare for what's coming, to deal with uh, the droughts that we know we'll, we're going to continue to have. This is an aspect uh, you know, that we've had for some time, but that because of you know, uh, the climate, it's going to continue to get worse. So we have to prepare for that and to make these smart investments. Thanks. Uh, the that's, next a, that's, a, that's a big cheers uh, line. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Uh, and the next question, audience question. The Texas legislature has passed uh, many anti-LGBTQ plus laws. What are you going to do in the U.S. Senate to represent and support LGBTQ plus Texans? Man, this is just heartbreaking to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of these people. I, I think, I, I, I think that y'all you know, means all thing. I mean, that's who we are as Texas, you know. Like, and To your point, Tim, about being a bit libertarian, like Texans, like this is this is actually, I think, fairly new. This is not like an obsession, you know, how people identify and who they love. Uh, it's coming to our politics, and you're seeing them targeting the most vulnerable people in our state. And I, I am sick of it. Listen, if you want to, there's one thing that I tell my boys every day not to be, it's a, and it's to be a bully. Don't be a bully. And that's what they're doing. They're bullying kids in this state. They're bullying people based on how they identify. But we can override all of that at the federal level. There's a legislation that I've voted for, co-sponsored, that we've not been able to get through the Senate called the Equality Act. 
Equality Act uh, would level the playing field in terms of extending the civil rights protections that we have uh, based on race and gender, national origin, to uh, sexual identity and how you identify. Uh, and so, and it would say, right now in Texas, it's still true that you could get married on Saturday and be fired on a Monday. The Equality Act would make, would invalidate all of that. And so, you know, I, I'm, I've been a supporter of that my entire time in Congress. Ted Cruz, I've never seen him spend more time on one single issue than when Bud Light had a trans spokesperson for one half second. <laughs> it's it like one can. It's like one it's can. It's like a yeah, promotional right. can, single can. Right. He, like, this is more, he spent more time on this than anything dealing with you know, national security or you know, policy. He spent weeks on this. Yeah. You know? I thought cancel culture was a problem. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and also corporate corporations making a decision of who they, of who they want to sell things to. Yeah. You want to be pro-business, right? You know? But it's just an example, though, that leadership matters and having a leader who doesn't target and pick on people, but who, who says, I appreciate us for our differences. I think that makes us great. That, that will make a huge difference for our state. The, uh, um, the one on this that gets under my nerves the most, I guess, and now that I got a kid in school, is the parents' right side of this. Yeah. It's like, we gotta be parents, we gotta take the gay penguin book out of the school so that, because the parents get to choose whether or not the penguin book's in there. And, I'm, and I, was, I was like, well, I'm a parent. Don't I get to have a say in that? Like, why is it that the craziest MAGA parent is the only one whose rights matter That's in this right. situation? That's right. That's <laughs> you know? right. That's right. Shouldn't every parent right. deal? You know, right. like it's parents' rights is just a code for like a certain type of parent. Also, banning books, man. Like, have they heard of the internet? Like, come on. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> when they do that, all they do is create a list for these kids to go read. They're yeah. like, oh, oh, thank you. Uh, you know, I should go check out Beloved. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, right. <laughs> you know, like, it's ridiculous. Uh, so you, you mentioned fentanyl earlier. How important is com combating the spread of fentanyl and fentanyl-related deaths to your platform, and what policies would you implement? I'm getting embarrassed about my questions. The audience questions are all much more serious <laughs> than mine. Well, it is what, like, you know, <laughs> 10 a.m. on a Saturday, right? <laughs> and uh, UT's playing Michigan and everything. You know? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, uh, we can align on this one. I'll be for the horns today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can well, they're, they're, well, they're going to win, so yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not, that's, that's my professional opinion, so. <laughs> Um, and so, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> fentanyl, fentanyl. Fentanyl, okay, okay, all right. So, l l l let's talk about it. So, uh, you know, fentanyl in particular uh, is something that is very difficult to deal with the trafficking of it because it can come in these precursor chemicals and be combined. You can buy a pill press on Amazon, right? Uh, and there are a couple, there's a multi-level steps that we have to take to this. One is making China crack down on what is happening in China. And this is something I've been doing in the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, because in an, author an authoritarian state, they know what's happening and they know who's shipping what to Mexico and to the United States. And they can help us be a part of that. Uh, when we've had disputes with them in the past, they have sometimes said, we're no longer gonna help you on the fentanyl side. And that has to be central to our negotiations with the Chinese, that you have to help us with this. We're gonna force you into doing this. The other part of it is at the border, but it's through ports of entry. Uh, and we have technology that can help us detect fentanyl. Uh, it's incredibly expensive, and we don't have enough of these scanners. And that's what was in the bipartisan Senate border bill, was funding for this, right? And so if you wanna talk about being tough on fentanyl, which I wanna be, and we've got to stop this. This is unbelievable what's doing to our communities. Then you have to then make the investments in the technology that will help us detect it. And so when Ted Cruz voted against that, he was voting for fentanyl in our state, right? And, and so then there's that. And then there's some aspects of uh, we've been working on that if something is being shipped under a certain value, then sometimes it doesn't get the same scrutiny. And it's, it's, it's very complicated. But basically, so many small shipments are, are going around our, our tracking. And we have to change that, because this is how, uh, even in small amounts, when you combine it, uh, you can have you know, these uh, produce fentanyl uh, here in the United States and in Mexico and, and bring it across. And so this, this, these are multiple pathways to this, but you have to make serious investments about it. And then the other side of it, of course, is on the public education side, which we've been trying to do for some time, which is informing our young people in particular. You know, that pill that you think is, you know, a Percocet or something, yeah. it, it, it's probably fentanyl. And don't, don't take that, right? Uh, you know, as a constituent of mine, uh, family, beautiful family, 
their son uh, just you know, happened to, you know, he thought he needed something to help him study. Uh, and he, he took a pill and it killed him. And you know, he wasn't somebody who was you know, pushing pills or anything like that. He just, he just wanted a study aid. And so part of this is we also have to, in all of our capacities, make sure that folks know that this is a different environment. You can't just buy stuff off the street. You can't trust this. It, it is and probably you know, can be incredibly deadly for you. All right. We're out of time. Thank you so much, Ian. Hey, everybody. The big. Uh, what, go find somebody in your life. Go find somebody in your life that doesn't believe their vote counts in Texas, because it does. Texas can turn. This is possible. I think that the apathy is a big problem in this state, and um, I think this is a man that can do it. So good luck, Congressman yeah. Allred. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.